located in Providence, Rhode Island. There was a man named Roger Williams. What happened in the history of Protestantism, they broke away, starting with Martin Luther, from the Roman Catholic Church. And the Church of England came out of that. And you had this Church of England. But still, even the Church of England back then, it still was somewhat corrupt, and they still had a lot of control over the people. And there was these people called Puritans. And they wanted the purity of church. They wanted the purity of worship. So the Puritans, they were many of them, most of them were pilgrims. They came over on the Mayflower in 1620. Sorry, Plymouth Colony. About 18 years later, there was a gentleman named Roger Williams, and he came out of that group. He was born in London, came over here to the U.S., and he was a Puritan, and he settled there initially in Massachusetts, but he still didn't agree with some of their, um, every Baptist church, how's the, how are they all birthed through a split? So basically what happened was he was there in Massachusetts, and he didn't get along with those people there, so they pretty much kicked him out, and he had to start a new colony. That colony is called Rhode Island. Rhode Island's a little state up in New England, New England, and that was actually a Baptist colony back in the good old days before, before our nation was founded. And Roger Williams went there, and he planted a church called First Baptist Church of Providence, Rhode Island. And that is the, truly the first Baptist church. Now, Roger Williams was a godly man, and the church was planted on the Word of God. It had a rich foundation and very, um, very solid in its teaching. Has any, I'm just curious before I say this. Has anybody been, you can actually go tour this church in Providence, Rhode Island. Anybody been to First Baptist Church in Providence, Rhode Island? All right, so has anybody ever even been to Rhode Island? Anybody know where Rhode Island is on a map? Okay, good. So there's a state there in New England called Rhode Island. And um, two people in the first service had actually toured this church. So what happened was I went and looked at this church. That church was started in 1638, founded on the Word of God. Our, our legacy is Baptist. We run through this church because this is all, all Baptist in America. It started right here. I look at what this church believes now, and its foundation has crumbled. They have drifted a long way from what Roger Williams. It's now gone down the road that does not believe in the power and the authority of the Word of God in their preaching and their ministry and in their practice. That occurred 384 years ago. And you can see how that foundation of Baptists here in America has in many ways crumbled away. On July 4th, 1776, Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. That's what started us as a nation, starting with 13 colonies, began the process that was then launched into the Revolutionary War. And he uh, declared their independence from Great Britain. That was 246 years ago. Do you know, if Roger Williams came back to that church in Providence, Rhode Island, he wouldn't recognize their church. He wouldn't recognize their teaching. It would be a long, it drifted a long way. We wonder if Thomas Jefferson came back from the dead, if that was another miracle, he came back from the dead and he toured America would Thomas Jefferson recognize the United States today? What he started with the Declaration of Independence, and he would look around and think, wow, that, it, it's continued what we started with, with, this, uh, with this declaration. Or would he look around and weep and think, this is so different. This is not initially what we were trying to create with a new country. And I share this because we as Christians... We stand on the people who laid the foundation before us. Someone brought you to church as a young person. Someone taught you the Bible. Someone has instructed you in the ways of the Lord. There is a foundation that was laid, and we stand on it. And for us as Christians, that foundation goes all the way back to Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. And the truth is, remember Jesus, he gave us on the Sermon on the Mount, he illustrated a story about how in Matthew chapter 7, 
there's going to be two ways to build a foundation. You're either going to build it on the rock, and that's going to stay firm, or you're going to build it on the sand, and it's going to crumble. The sound foundation at First Baptist Providence right now has crumbled. We as a nation here, we hope our, our nation uh, doesn't crumble. We hope it stays solid. We live, I believe, is an honor to be an American. We live in a wonderful nation. It's an honor to be a Baptist. There might be a lot of problems with Baptists. We, I mean, how, we talked about that last month with the Southern Baptist Convention, but they'll, they'll address all of that. They will. But what does it mean to be a Baptist? We believe in the inerrancy of the Scriptures. Every word in this book here is the Word of God. And not only that, we believe in believer's baptism. When you get saved and you walk this aisle and you give your heart and life to Jesus, you come here to our baptistry and you get baptized. Now, baptism, it does not save you. In other uh, denominations, the baptism will actually save you. There's one denomination, they actually leave their baptistry filled up at all the time. So if you came by the church office, this is really, I have met somebody that has happened to. They're like, and they got saved in the church office. The pastor immediately runs you over to the baptistry and dunks you right there with lights off and everything in the middle of the pitch black dark so you can get baptized so you can be saved. That's not biblical. Baptism represents your old life going under the water. You're dying to sin. That's what it is. It's symbolic. You're identifying with Jesus' death when you are baptized. And your new life coming out of the water. That's why you have to be fully immersed it's your death and you're buried and then you come up as a resurrection that is what we call believers baptism and if you haven't received believers baptism you're living in disobedience to god and you're not a baptist because part of being a baptist is you've received believers baptism so i share all this because this is a foundation that we get from the Scriptures. It's a foundation that we believe as Christians. We baptize new believers in Christ. You're not doing it to please your friends or to me or anybody else. You're doing it to please the Lord. Always an audience of one when you come to worship. But here we are in our Bible verse we're about to read here. And the Bible verse is about to tell us that we need to make sure we always stand on the foundation that was uh, laid before us because foundations do crumble and you always want to make sure it's strong because that foundation that was once rock it can easily become sand if you step off or if you're not on the right foundation and i believe there's nothing more that the devil wants to do in our lives is destroy churches and destroy families that is the fastest way to destroy the United States. One of the greatest stories of the United States that's rarely told is the United States, in the history of all of Christianity, has seen the greatest missionary sending force ever. And luckily, Southern Baptists were a part of that. Where, they, where our denomination that we give to is the one that's sending and going and giving so that the uttermost parts of the earth can hear about Jesus. No other nation has done more than that, of taking the gospel to the world. We received it from the pilgrims and the Puritans, and we go out and share it among everyone else. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. So then remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh. What does that phrase mean? Gentiles, and we don't talk like that. I don't typically go up and refer to somebody as a Gentile in the flesh. I don't even call people Gentiles. I mean, that's just not, that's just not our language of, the t of today. What this is talking about, remember, this is, has a Jewish audience. Back in Bible times, you were Jewish or you were not Jewish. And if you weren't Jewish, you were Gentile. Gentile means non-Jewish. So, Typically, Gentiles, non-Jewish people, they did not live according to the biblical law and the biblical standard. So, when it says Gentiles in the flesh, that meant these people who were outside of the Ten Commandments, who didn't live by the Mosaic law, they just lived in the flesh. They just did whatever they wanted to. 
They were wild. Anything goes. We probably today live in a Gentiles in the flesh context. Of, it's very easy to think this way. Called the uncircumcised by those called the circumcised, which is done in the flesh by human hands. At that time, you were without Christ. Now, there, we're going to see a contrast here. The Bible saying at one time you were lost. At this time here, according to verse 13, you were without Christ. You were excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenant of promise. Without hope and without, the, without God in the world. That is a description of what it looks like to live here in 2022 without Christ in your law, life. This is what it's like. People who are not saved, they have no hope. They don't have Christ in their life. And they're, they're, they're living this world without, without the assurance of having this citizenship in heaven. When you, The moment you were saved, Look, I'm an American citizen. I was born in Alabama. I just barely made the cut, but we're like the 49th, 50th state. And that's our flag. That's my flag right there as a U.S. citizen. But here, according to the Bible, there is a citizenship that's greater than what country we were born in. And that's our citizenship in heaven. The moment you're saved, your name is written in the book of life. It, which is in heaven, it's not here on earth, it's not the Library of Congress down here. It's in heaven with the Lord. And our new citizenship gets us there. Our passports get us from country to country. But your passport does not go into heaven. Your passport into heaven is your relationship that you have been redeemed, that means saved, by the blood of Jesus. So look at the contrast here. You, at one point you were excluded from this. But now, but look at verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. At one point you were lost, you were over there, but now you got saved. Now you are near. Do you all see the contrast? Our lives should reflect this. One day I lived like a lost man. I met Christ. He transformed my life. And now I live like a saved man. My life is different. If you are saved and you're in this sanctuary right now, your life should be different. If it did not change, if, it's not, if there's no change whatsoever, transformation in your life, you really have to stop and ask yourself, God, am I saved? Did, did my life change? Was I transformed? And the Bible goes on to tell us, for he is our peace, who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. In his flesh, he made of no effect the law concerning of commands and expressed in regulations, so that he might create himself one new man from the two, resulting in peace. This is what the saving power of the gospel does. He did this so that he might reconcile both the God and one body through the cross by which he put the hostility to death. These are big theological words. Reconciliation. That is what Jesus did to us. These are people who do not know the Lord and by the, what Jesus did. You notice the word blood, the word cross is used. That's why what is so important for Christians, we as American citizens, we're under the U.S. flag right there, but... For Christians, our flag isn't a flag, it's a cross. The Bible tells us the cross and the blood is what brings us reconciliation. Every time we see this cross, we're reminded, Jesus died for me. Jesus came to save me. This is our message. This is what we take to people who do not know the Lord. Do you know someone who's not saved? Do you know someone who's in need of reconciliation? The Bible says they're actually living in hostility to God. This is what I think is, so, this is what struggles so much for myself and maybe other Christians. We live in such a wonderful nation, and we see things that happen, and it seems like it's, they're going backwards. Like, well, what are these people thinking? We have to remember, lost people aren't going to live according to the Bible. 
They aren't. They aren't going to value life. They aren't going to value marriage. They aren't going to live uh, according what God's standard. I'll give you a per example. Someone I know, I'm not going to tell you who, someone I know, a young lady, she was dating this guy. At one point, she was very active in church, but now she's, it's been years since then. This past week, she was announcing she's moving in with her boyfriend. Well, folks, that's sinful. Sexual immorality is wrong. God says we save ourselves for sex until we're married. That's the context for sexuality in our life. So I was watching this person. I'm thinking, my goodness, she knows better. But that's, that is how someone who is not living and who does not love the Lord makes decisions. That is what the Bible calls the hostility to the Lord. When you are not saved, everything you do, you don't realize it, it actually opposes Scripture and opposes God. That's what a Gentile in the flesh. So we as saved, born-again people, we wake up and we are to live differently than the world. We wake up and say, Lord, I'm yours. I live in this immoral world, immoral city, immoral country, but I've been called out of that. I'm not, I'm not part of that. I live what Jesus says here as a new man. You're no longer this person. You're a new man, a new woman for Jesus. So you look at your life this morning, and you say, my foundation, what is it? It's being a new man for Jesus. Once I was this man, now I'm a new man. He did this so that he might reconcile both to God and one body through the cross by which he put the hostility to death. He came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. Meaning people who are far away and people who are near. The gospel, the, the message of Jesus goes to both types of people. What that means is someone who's not saved, who are far away from God, they can turn to the Lord and get saved. You could do that this morning. People who are near, that's folks who are saved, that's me, that's you possibly. That means when you hear the word of God preached, you're encouraged because this is our foundation. This is life-giving words. For through him we both have access to one spirit, to the Father. So then, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints, and members of God's household. Look at this. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as a cornerstone. We are a member. Do you know, it uses the word member. You can actually become a member of Broadway Baptist Church. You can join, you can join the church. The way to join the church is not and not just say, I want to be a member. You first have to be a member of God's household. That means you must be saved first. So a church, what is a church? A church is a group of saved people who have, have their citizenship in heaven and who have Jesus Christ here as their foundation, their cornerstone of their life. And what happens in the context of a church we hold one another accountable. Listen, do you know of anyone that maybe at one point used to go to church here, but now they've drifted away? Do you know, I, 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 I enjoy Sunday school, and um, I fill out the little role. And every week, I fill that role out. And there's one person on there. They, I think have, in two years they've been here one time. And it's convicting to me every time I see that name. Oh, I'm almost I'm glad the Lord just leaves that name on there because it's a reminder of me this week. I need to let this person know, hey, I've missed you at church. I've missed seeing you. Because when you're a member of God's household and you've drifted away, could you imagine having children? We have four children. Sherry's sister has five children. What if we go, we got our church picnic this afternoon. What if Sherry and I show up and we only bring three? And then BJ comes up to me and says, where is your fourth child? Oh, I don't know. That's a good question. We lost them. I, 
Could you just imagine going somewhere and losing a child? But what's even sadder is could you imagine going somewhere and no one even noticing or asking where my missing child is? I once had four, we had three, and they vanished. When you don't hold one another accountable, that's essentially what is happening right here. It's just like, oh, they, they, they just drifted off. Who knows what happened to them? Being a part of God's household means we have a foundation that's a group of people who's built and centered on Jesus Christ. And it says here, in the whole building being put together grows into the temple of the Lord. That means we experience spiritual growth in this. In Him you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the Spirit. I mean, God builds His church. He builds your lives. He has established a foundation, and He expects us to continue holding one another on that, that foundation and growing ourselves on that foundation. Jesus told us on the Sermon on the Mount that you should build your foundation on the rock. Jesus looked at Peter and said, Peter, and own this rock, which rock meant you. You're the rock, Peter. Petros, I will build my church. The church here not just our church, the whole worldwide Bible-believing church is the foundation for Christ's work. He has chosen to use churches like ours and the millions of other churches in the world to do His kingdom ministry throughout the world. Now, this first section here is teaching us how our foundation, our lives, are centered and built on the Word of God. And no matter how much changes here in 22 and 20, now trust me, everything changes in the world today. What we do today, there'll be something new next week. I mean, all the thing I know is it's going to change. So everything uh, is, is different. But once you have that foundation, then at that point, Paul now, he's writing to his church in Ephesus. He's going to say, here's how you go out and you do ministry among changing culture. Verse, chapter 3, verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus. Now, he wrote this while he's in prison. Now, I think if you or I are in prison, we would not likely not write this way. If I was probably in prison, I would be probably writing letters or trying to make phone calls to Sherry saying, we need to get an attorney, you need to get me out of here, we need to file laws, I mean, just whatever, whatever it would take to get out. Not Paul, this guy's different. I, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming you have heard about the administration of God's grace that he gave me for you, the mystery was made known to me by revelation. As I have briefly written above, by reading this, you were able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. What is this mystery he's talking about? The mystery of Christ is Jesus. The mystery of Christ is God chose the cross to reveal his saving plan. The whole Old Testament, all they were doing was going around practicing circumcision and following the Ten Commandments and the Law of Moses. And they're thinking, is this it? Is this how we're going to be saved? We just obey the law, we go practice circumcision, and we go to church and the temple and bring our little sacrifice. And all of a sudden, they knew something more was going to come. And the mystery here, the final revelation, who was it? It was Christ. Jesus came to be that sacrifice. That is the, what reconciliation means. And it goes on to say here, this was not made known to people in other generations as now revealed, to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Don't miss that. Back in the old days, they didn't know. But God took these apostles. What's an apostle? An apostle is someone who was with Jesus. Jesus had 12 disciples. That's an interchangeable word. They're also called the 12 apostles. But, any, but Paul, who was not part of the 12, he, but he did see Jesus. He's also referenced as an apostle. So people who experienced, who were with the presence and looked at Jesus and saw Jesus, they're called apostles and who were believers in Jesus. They were the foundation of the church. But then it says they had these prophets. Prophets are people who go out and proclaim the word of the God. Apostles and prophets wrote our Bible. That is our foundation. So God raised up these men and women who were apostles and prophets. And it says here, He's revealed, he's taken them by the Holy Spirit, and he's going to do something with that. So we have to remember, 
our worship this morning, and us worshiping here on this July 4th weekend, we started with a foundation that was actually laid by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. We're here this 4th of July weekend thinking Thomas Jefferson from 246 years ago writing the Declaration of Independence. We as Baptists, we think of Roger Williams, who started the very first Baptist church here in America 384 years ago. You can look back and see all of these foundations, but that does not mean those foundations will always be solid. Now, we know the Bible will be a solid foundation. We know Jesus' church will always exist, but there's many churches that can drift away from the word of the Lord, that can no longer teach and preach that Jesus is the only way to salvation. The Bible's telling us here in verse 6, the Gentiles are co-heirs, members of the same body. If you're not Jewish, you're a Gentile. And the Bible's reassuring us that we are also members of the same covenant that all the Jews are a part of. The Old Testament, the covenant, was the Mosaic covenant. That's how they were saved, through the teachings that were revealed that started with Moses. The New Testament covenant is the covenant of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross and our salvation. And we take, as as New Testament believers, we see that the Mosaic, the Old Testament covenant, was actually fulfilled with this new covenant. We identify with that. And even though we're we're Gentiles, we are co-heirs, meaning we're part of the kingdom. We're members of this body. We're partners in the promise of Christ. Jesus, through the gospel, I was made a servant in the gospel by the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the working of his power. It's the saving power of Jesus. When you are saved, it's not that you save yourself. We are not good people to earn our salvation. Only the Lord saves us. Any and everything we do comes through the saving power. And the word power there is used. And we have to remember, our access to prayers, Our access to the saving power of Jesus, where does it come from? Not from us, it's solely of Him. If you are wondering, God, why aren't you hearing my prayers? Why aren't you uh, uh, performing healings and miracles in my life? Why do I not see the Lord like I used to? I think it likely could be because of this. We have forgotten that, Lord, it's you. It's not me. Lord, you're the one that does the saving power. We trust in the Lord. We wake up in the morning and say, Lord, I'm yours. I'm saved by your saving power. This grace was given to me, the least of all the saints, to proclaim to the Gentiles the incalculable riches of Christ. That's what Jesus says that describes our salvation, our citizenship, is incalculable riches. Like you don't realize how wonderful it is to shed light for all about the administration of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. This is so that God's multifaceted wisdom may now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavens. God has chosen, the word church is used, chosen to use the church to make known the mystery. All of these people, all of these folks here in our wonderful city, in our land, do not know where to find happiness, fulfillment, and peace. They're looking in all the wrong places, and God is saying, the church, the message of the gospel preached through the church is, even goes all the way up to kings and those of rulers, and that is where they find their hope. This is according to the eternal purpose accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Him, we have boldness and confident access through faith in Him. You woke up this morning, you should have a boldness in the Lord. The tomb is empty. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. You are a citizen in heaven. You have a power and authority that lost people do not have. You have access to God. You can pray to the Lord, who is the creator of all things, and He hears and He answers those prayers. And Bible's telling us that we no longer need to live a defeated life. We have a confidence in the Lord that literally He has won the victory. The devil has been defeated. There is actual victory in Jesus. And the Bible's telling us we should never forget this boldness that we have. 
Paul's writing this letter while in jail. Now, if you were in jail, would you summarize your, this little section with this next verse? The last verse we read today. Because some of us here, we, have lived a, we are living discouraged and defeated lives. And it says here in verse, verse 13, So then, because you have access to all of these things, I ask you not to be discouraged over my afflictions on your behalf, for they are your glory. Do you know if we were sitting in jail, we would be asking people to help us get out. Paul's sitting in jail saying, don't be discouraged that I'm in jail. Don't get upset about it. Do you know of anybody with the, with the gift of discouragement? And when you talk to them, they, their specialty is bringing you down. Paul is sitting in jail encouraging other people. I want to tell you something. If you come here this morning and you are discouraged, you're lonely, you're sad, you're depressed, and you're just life is not where you want it to be. And you're saved. You know the Lord. Do you know you need to shift your thinking just like Paul did? Paul went around telling other people not to be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. You need to have boldness and confidence in the Lord. If any of the people should have been discouraged and down and out, it should have been Paul. Paul was called by the Lord. Paul was chosen by Jesus, and he finds himself in jail writing happy letters of encouragement. Folks, when you focus on your circumstances, you will find yourself discouraged. He would not allow his circumstances to define him. Why didn't he do that? Because his foundation was in Jesus Christ. His citizenship is in heaven. His hope and his peace was in the Lord, was in the cross, was in the blood of Jesus. His name was written in the book of life. Paul never lost that focus. And this morning for us, no matter what happens here in our wonderful country, no matter what even happens in Baptist life or out there, our hope, our encouragement, folks, it's in the Lord. It's done. It is sealed. We take confidence in King Jesus. We serve as encouragers. If there's a member, like it says here, a member of the household that's not here, we go and encourage them to come. And everyone needs encouragement. Paul was an encourager, not a discourager. Think about all the things you could be discouraged and down and out about right, right now. We could just literally, I bet you could name more things to complain about than to be excited about. But not Paul. He was one that was even while in jail with his afflictions, enduring his pain, a blessing to other people. And he's asking you, the, the Lord is asking you, will you do the same? You have a foundation that was built on a rock of Jesus Christ, and now you have a ministry to all the people out there who need the Lord. And where does it start? It starts with you. It starts with me. It starts with our church. All, all ministry is starts local. If you aren't sharing the gospel here, what makes you think you are going to become an evangelist over there? Paul tells us, so then, I ask you not to be discouraged. And folks, I ask you that this morning. Are you discouraged? Are you sad by some, maybe some events and circumstances that have happened in your life? If Paul's asking that question, the Lord is asking that question right now. The first step, if you do not know the Lord, the Lord gives you encouragement. Encouragement is a spiritual gift. Later on in the book of Ephesians, we'll see that. A gift of encouragement, chapter 5. If you are here this morning, you've never been saved, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray and receive receive the grace, the life that Jesus gives. He extends salvation to you and I. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And you're going to cry and call out to God and say, Lord, I want the boldness. I want the confidence. I want the encouragement that my Bible talks about here. 
I'm tired of being defeated. I'm tired of unanswered prayers. I'm tired of living this life that's just down and out. Lord, I want more. Lord, I want you. You say this prayer if you want to receive Jesus. And I tell you, some of you are going around telling people you're Baptist, but you've never received believer's baptism. And you need to get baptized. Some of you, the word used member is right here. You're talking about how you're a member, but you're not a member of Broadway. And the only way to be a member of Broadway is to be saved and baptized. And then you become a member of this church. I want you to cry and call out to the Lord right now. I'm going to say this prayer. I want you to follow on. This is a prayer of faith. And Jesus Christ, He hears, even you say it slightly, He hears and sees what you're saying. This is what it means to get saved. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. I need a Savior. Lord, I need you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for making me a new man. Jesus, from this day on, I'm yours. Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want you to look up. Folks, if you said that prayer, you are saved. I never want you, you can never save your best for later. You need to be able to go to heaven from the last church service you attended. And this could be, we don't know what our future holds. This could be your last church service. My job as a, a gospel preaching preacher is to make it clear as day how to be saved and how to respond to God. We're going to have our time of response. I want to invite everyone to stand up. The way we close our worship services here, I stand down front here. Zach Bauer stands right there. If you got saved this morning, you come take my hand and say, Pastor, I gave my life to Christ. Maybe some of you, or I know some of you do, some of you need to get baptized and join this church. There's no better church here to belong to. It's a Bible-believing church, totally centered on family ministry. And this church is a, this service here is a part of that, reaching families and people for the Lord. Zach, you come stand with me. Beecher, we're going to lead our closing song. The wounds of Jesus, I surrender all to him, I freely give. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Uh, just a quick announcement. Hopefully you did receive a bulletin. You looked in there. We want to invite everyone to our church picnic tonight at 5 o'clock at Masterson Station Park Pavilion. 
four, so I uh, would love to have you. We're providing uh, the main dishes and some side dishes. Uh, you're, you're encouraged to bring a dessert or another side uh, uh, to uh, contribute, uh, but not necessary. You can still just come and enjoy it. Uh, there is a splash pad nearby for kids, playground, so it's a great place uh, for your kids to come and just a good time of fellowship. Uh, hopefully you check your bulletin for other announcements. Uh, I'll go to the church website. There's always things on there. Everything you really need to know or would want to know is on there. Upcoming events. We have an upcoming youth event in a couple Wednesdays. Uh, if you're a student, 6 through 12, you're invited. So you have to sign up for that one, so sign up. Uh, just and we, It's been a delight to worship with everyone today. Uh, and enjoy. Thank you uh, for our visitors. Uh, we're glad. I know there's some people just passing through. I met a, a family. They're just passing through. Um, and, you know, we want to be a church that's faithful to proclaim the word. And, and uh, you know, we are delighted that we as Christians, we can worship anywhere. We don't have to go to the temple. We can worship anywhere and with other believers. So uh, that is a great uh, privilege made possible through Jesus and his work on the cross. So that is what we proclaim, we preach, and we delight in. Uh, let's pray and we will be dismissed. God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for the work of Jesus that has set us free, that has ransomed us and reconciled us to God. We were sinners. We were far off. Uh, we did not know you. We were, in fact, your enemies. But through Jesus, uh, we have been made friends. Uh, so, Lord, may we uh, worship and delight in that, God, and be encouragement to one another and in this church. And, Lord, we pray and ask, uh, and we know that you will continue to build your church, God. So, Lord, with it, we keep our foundation in you and on your word and be obedient to what you've called us to do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.